This is the Infinite Receiving Podcast, helping conscious leaders tap into a wealth of abundance across all areas of your life and business. I'm Susie Ashworth, and I'll be sharing with you how you can upgrade your reality through quantum transformation, because you are ready for infinite receiving. Hello, 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 you gorgeous human being. It is Susie Ashworth, and you are listening to the Infinite Receiving Podcast. And I have got a juicy one for you today. You know what it means when I say I've got a juicy one for you? I'm going to introduce you to somebody that I know you are going to want to know. And so it is my great pleasure to share with you an old friend, old client, an absolute kick-ass entrepreneur who is shaking up the game. Do you know what? She's not shaking up the game. She is forging a whole new path when it comes to mindset and mentorship and manifesting and strategy. Let me make sure it has always been about the strategy when it comes to Asian female entrepreneurs and then making their own way in this world. So welcome to the podcast, Sean Kyra. How the fuck are you? I'm doing brilliantly. Oh my God, that was such an introduction. So thank you so much, Suze. And you've known me for so long and know me so well. So this is going to be so interesting. <laughs> yeah, it was funny because as I was doing the intro, I almost missed out the strategy. Now, the thing is, I know Sean, and Sean has always, almost first and foremost, been about the strategy. And I love that you have added the mindset in over the years because behind the scenes, it's been a huge piece of the puzzle for you. In order to get to where you've got to, there have been so many huge mindset challenges that you have had to overcome. So I would love actually for us to go back to the beginning and let's talk about little Sean because I think that if little Sean knew where big Sean was going to be at this point in time, she would be pretty amazed. So that younger version of you, who was she? What was her experience of life like? Wow. Yeah. That is just so powerful what you shared there, because honestly, younger Sean would be so proud of older Sean right now. So actually, I was never meant to be born, actually, because my parents were told that they would never have children. And after 10 years, I came into the world like complete miracle baby. My parents were first generation Asian immigrants into the country. So my upbringing was, I would say, really difficult. I was raised on the roughest streets of my hometown, surrounded by drugs and prostitution. My parents spoke very little English and they held down like three jobs trying to raise us. Like my granddad mainly was raising us, to be really honest. I hardly saw my parents. I had a younger brother who had learning difficulties. And I think from a really young age, like I'm talking like four or five, I really took on the role of a caregiver, a parent, constantly translating for Mm. my parents, constantly like filling out forms and mortgage applications and ringing you like utility companies. And then coupled with like going to school and constantly feeling really different, being really aware that I looked different, I sounded different, my name was different. So I think like growing up and obviously adding on the layer of like our culture where Asian women aren't meant to be seen and heard, I think I just had a very, very difficult childhood. My parents were amazing. They were lovely. But they were also very, very strict on me. So I wasn't allowed to like go out with like white friends. People weren't allowed to come around my house. I wasn't allowed to cut my hair. I wasn't allowed to like wear makeup. It was all very, very restrictive, really. At the time, did you resent the life that you were living or did it feel 
normal, even though you knew it was different from many of the people around you? Was it normal enough for you to just be like, well, this is just how it is? No, I think I really resented it. Like, so we lived in a house which was like, honestly, like terrible. Like it was like damp ridden and infested. Like it was hideous. And I just remember like, not being able to have friends over and just missing out on like normal things like going to kids children's like children's parties like birthday parties I think I went to one and I think my memory of that is like arriving really late and like not having anyone to play with and then like being really different at school so like no one was really hanging around with me and I think I really resented like I remember I used to watch like shows for example like you know, like American shows and, you know, these kind of high schooly stuff on TV. And I just really resented like the situation I was in because it was just so restrictive and just so different. But I think I knew from a really young age, I didn't want my life to be like this forever. And and that's where like the rebelling came in. And this was obviously in a time where, you know, like, for example, like if I was like going out on a night out, like when I finally started to see the light when I was 15, 16, we were like, I didn't see any other Asian girls going out. Like going out was like, oh, you're bringing shame onto the family. Like you should die. So um, I was literally like sneaking out with my friends, like lying to my parents, literally doing all the things. And obviously like that brings along so much shame and guilt as well. And I was constantly navigating these like two identities. Like, am I like this Western Asian girl who's being brought up in the UK or am I like this traditional Asian girl that my parents want me to be? And when that's conflicting, that's really difficult, I think. Yeah. So there was a part of you that wanted to be good. And there was another part of you that was just like, I need to be me. And it's interesting. I slowed it down when I said that because was there a point in your thinking where you decided that you weren't very good? Because I kind of made those two separate things. And actually, we know that you're a really good human now. But at that point, did you think being me is bad? Yeah, I think I had like really low self-worth as a child anyway. I knew I was like a good person. Like if you looked at my like report cards, like they'd be like, Shh, Gushan is so kind and so lovely. But I think I knew that I was like very, very different. And I think that like, yeah, I just found that very challenging. And as like a child, like I was, I, I think I was overeating to like compensate for feeling so awful you know and I was like doing things like for example I wasn't showing up to school in like secondary school because I just Mm. couldn't hack the fact that I had no friends and I used to spend like most of my lunch hours in the toilet because I literally had no friends so I, I I think from a really young age like Yeah, I think I definitely lacked confidence. I definitely had like low self-worth and low self-esteem for sure. How do you think that those times and experiences as a child have really served you now in the role that you play in other people's lives? And I'm thinking as well, specifically around the parenting piece, like feeling like you were parenting all of those things at the time were really tough what what were the gifts in those moments yeah I think the own transformation that I had like from like 16 to 19 was huge and I think that like my cousins laugh about it right now like they always say like literally they just thought I was going to get like an arranged marriage and that was going to be the end of me like I was going to have no career it's going to have this arranged marriage and that was like th- there wasn't many expectations from me for my life like both internally and externally and I think because I went through such a transformation back then and then obviously my own transformation a couple of years ago I can truly see that like anything is freaking possible. Like, even if you lack resources, like lack time, lack the socioeconomic background, I know it sounds really cliche, but I've come from a position where 
you know, if you look at my life now, like this wasn't meant to be the plan for me. You know, this was on paper. People would never think that this would be possible for me. So I think it really helps in seeing situations now where like when things do get tough, because of course they do in the entrepreneurial journey, I'm always like, right, like anything is possible. We can do this. But also then when I work with clients as well, I truly believe in transformation because I've experienced it and embodied it truly on a core level. So I think it really helps me become obviously shining a light on where they want to change, but also being empathetic and sympathetic at the same time. You know, I think that's really important, especially when it comes to Asian women, because of the way we've been culturally conditioned. What specifically stands out to you about that time between 16 and 19? What changed? So I remember at school, obviously, I was like the biggest geek. I had hardly any friends. And I just remember at school, it being like the last day of school, everyone's crying. And I had like one really good friend, actually. She was really sweet. And we kind of bonded because like, you know, her mom, like she had committed suicide. It'd been really traumatic for her. She was so sweet. And I remember thinking, yeah, I hate school. I'm not crying. I'm so glad this is over. And I remember thinking, because back then I had like greasy hair. I had no fashion sense. I was never allowed to wear makeup. But I was thinking, okay, like by the time I go to college, not on like a superficial level, but like I'm going to change myself, how I look externally, but also internally as well. As like, I'm going to get confident, I'm going to change myself and I'm just going to be a different person by that the, by the time summer's over. So that summer, I got myself a job at Pizza Hut waitressing. Oh, I didn't know that. Did you work at Pizza Hut? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they wouldn't give me a promotion. It was the best thing of my life. They were like, you're not good enough. I was like, fuck you. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, so I really, I really like pushed myself outside my comfort zone because I was like, okay, waitressing, I'm going to have to talk to people and this is going to be uncomfortable and I'm not going to like it. But it really helped me grow my like confidence. And I met some really lovely people actually that summer and they obviously didn't know me from school. So it was like, I was like a new person. And I remember going to like House of Fraser and being like, and this is obviously like my mum was like, you're not doing this. But I was like, forget it, I'm doing it. So I went to House of Fraser and I was like, okay, like I need like new makeup. So can you give me like foundation, lipstick, mascara? And then I booked an appointment at like our local like Tony and Guy and I had like really curly hair. And obviously back then it was like the whole poker straight, Jennifer Aniston kind of straight hair. And I was like, can you like chemically straighten it for me? And I remember like by the time like college rolled around, I looked like a completely different person. And those people that were like not so nice to me at school and like the boys and stuff, they like now really wanted to know me because I just had changed internally and externally. Do you know where that desire came from or that awareness came from that you were going to be able to essentially press a reset and start again? Had you seen it on TV or with other people or was it just an internal knowing that this was an opportunity for you? So it's really interesting. So my parents have always been like manual labor workers and they're retired right now. But my dad had two brothers and a sister who absolutely love them but they were like self-made multi-millionaires and I always looked at them never with like actually never with anything around like jealousy or envy but I almost saw like what they were building for their lives like you know what like the kind of holidays they were going on the kind of clothes that my cousins were wearing the things they were buying the kind of houses they were like building at the time and I just thought I just use that as inspiration. I think I watched a lot of Bollywood films as well, where there were like Bollywood actresses where they'd have like their little mini transformation. I think anyone else in my position would have been really, really envious of like my other family members. But honestly, like, I think because I saw it from such a young age, I've never been envious. I've always thought, how can I do that myself? Because you know, my aunts and uncles, like they came to this country with nothing. They couldn't speak English. English wasn't their first language. They didn't have the internet. So if they can do it and they suffered yeah. a lot of racism, like back then as well, 
Like, why can't I when I've got more resources than them and, and an education? I really love this because what I'm hearing is, is so you had a model and whilst maybe you have a different blueprint that you've used versus them, you had a model. And when you can see it, it makes it, as long as you've got the right mindset, some people can be envious, some people can be jealous and other people are like, aha, if they can do it, I can do it. And I know that what motivates you, it's very similar to what motivates me, being a woman of color in this space, we understand that it is important to talk about our successes. It's important to talk about where we came from and it's important to share where we're going because we get to be that model for other people who don't have that in their families, who have never seen that for generations back, back, back. It's like, oh, it might not be in my family, but that woman actually looks like me. If it's possible for her, it might actually be possible for me. So I love that you're able to connect those dots. Sean, did you go to university? I did indeed, yeah. So I went to university as well. Again, I was never like, never meant to go to uni just because of like the schooling that I'd, I'd had, the grades that I'd got. But I was, again, from a really young age, I knew that like my path out of this was going to be some sort of education. Honestly, mm-hmm. like it was such a battle with my parents, like my dad being interviewed and like rejected for like jobs at McDonald's. And like I remember like once he went for a job, it was like a prison cleaner and he'd been rejected. And I remember like, I used to fill out his like application mm-hmm. forms for him. And I remember like the sheer panic and fear on my parents' faces when like, they were like, oh my God, like my dad's lost his job. Like he can't get another job because he can speak English. So I think from a really young age, even I didn't even know anyone who'd been to uni. I think my cousin's had been, but I really didn't really know what uni was, but I, I knew that like I wanted to go because educated people, obviously I knew I'd have more opportunities if I was educated. Yeah, sure. When did the, your entrepreneurial journey start? <sighs> I think, I think I knew really early on that I wanted to be my own boss. So I remember I went traveling and t- when I was 18, again, like all hell broke loose in my family. Apparently I was bringing shame onto the family. Like my uncles weren't talking to me. My mum was like, oh my God, God, what is actually happening to my daughter? Is she like possessed? But anyway, I digress. Like there was just so much like commotion around that. And I remember before I went traveling, I got myself a job at Nationwide. And it was just doing admin work, but honestly, it was so boring But then I just thought to myself, okay, if I get myself a degree, it will be different when I've got my degree and I'm going into a more kind of higher paid role in a different sector. But then obviously I kept jumping from job to job to job. So my first kind of entrepreneurial part was obviously I started my wedding planning business before my coaching and mentoring business. So that actually before Mm -hmm. that, me and my friend did a Asian dating website. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> yeah. That was back in like 2010, but it was on a different company's platform and they started taking like more and more of our commission. So again, I realized like if I'm going to do something, it has to be on my own. It has to be on my platform, on my own platform and probably not with a friend. So I, that was like my first kind of entrepreneurial rodeo. Then it was my wedding planning business. And then obviously my coaching and mentoring business. How did you deal with the shame that your parents and family members tried to pour on you for really just living your life, actually? Because I think that within, I think across many communities, people feel like that. And then I know that they're, they're feels like there is an extra layer within the Asian community and the desire to please. So how did you deal with that? I think honestly, back then, I think I just blocked it out. It's probably not the best thing to do. I think if I was in that position now, I, you know, I'd be having really tough conversations. I'd be like, sharing my thoughts with people but back then like me and my mum didn't have a very good relationship for so many years you know she was a great mum but I almost like blocked it out with external things so external things being like 
you know, going out, getting drunk, going on holidays, traveling. And just, I think just showing, just always showing my parents, like, I'm not going to change. This is who I am. And I'm going to continue to do the things that I want to do. And I think in the end, like my mum especially just, just came around to the fact that I am independent. I know what's best for myself. And now she's like my biggest cheerleader. Like we get on so well. Like she always is so supportive. Like if she she wants to do anything big in her life, she always asks, like asks me for advice, almost like permission. So I think it was, I think it was really tough. But I think if I was to do that now, it would definitely be like more open communication. But back then it was just literally just blocking things out, I think. Did you feel isolated? I think obviously as a child I did. But then like when I was like growing up and like going to uni, like not so much. Because the other great thing about university was for the first time like in my life, I'd met other Asian girls, boys Mm -hmm. that were like, we were all in the similar position. So you know, we'd be at uni, like obviously like get drunk during the week, go to freshers, all these things as you do as uni students. And our parents didn't know that we were like drinking. And obviously like social media wasn't huge then, it was just Facebook. So like we were all really careful of like the pictures we were putting on Facebook, like making sure like, you know, we weren't seen with boys or like drinks in our hands. Like we were all in the same boat. Now it's so different. Like I look at my cousin's kids and we tell them what we went through and they they look at us as if we're on a different planet, you know. But back then, like we were all in the same position. It wasn't just my parents. It was all Asian parents who were very, very strict on their children. I think that first generation especially were very, very strict. What's really interesting is that what I'm hearing is is that, one, it was a generational thing. So the Indian culture, Asian culture coming over to the West. And so you guys were Western Asian children. And so it wasn't actually just you. It was a whole generation of people that grew up and it's the merging of cultures. However, when you're working with clients now, it still feels as though there is a lot of that cultural imprinting that impacts how Asian women show up for themselves, approach going into business, and then who they are in business. Does that, does that feel true? A hundred percent, because I think that when we were growing up, Like we didn't know what our true identity was because we had so many different masks. So we had this mask for when we were at school. We had this mask for when we are like with our friends, our uni friends, our childhood friends, then with our parents and then like with our elders and our cousins. So I think a lot of Asian women struggle with their own identity. Like who are they without all of these external factors, like who, what is their true essence. And I think when it comes to business, like I think a lot of Asian women, and I've definitely been through the same and kind of always like, I'm kind of working through something like that right now where we're really thinking about like, who are we? If, if there wasn't all these external factors and external stories playing into our mindset and playing into our psyche, like, who actually are we? And then how do we translate that into our business and showing up? Because I know like my clients, like I'm in my 30s, like some of my clients are in their 40s as well. Like we don't know what we should be showing up as online because we don't, we've truly grown with our identity at such a core level. And then there's always this thing around like, because I still think in our Asian community, there is, I think it's changing now, but there's like an emphasis put on, oh, so-and-so is better because they're a dentist or a doctor. And this like entrepreneurial thing is so new. Like my cousins, they think I'm like some sort of influencer. They're like, kids are like, oh, they're Sean, the influencer, which, yeah, obviously I think everyone's got influence, but it's like something really new for them. So it's like also dealing with that and like, you know, just when you have people like for example like even on my social media I've got my brother-in-law's on there I've got my cousins and then it's like you you're a different way with them because they're your family members 
But then obviously online, you do want to share stuff that, you know, um, you know, I, for example, like I, I shared at my event a few weeks ago, I, I was like hospitalized just before Christmas. I got this really random infection. I was in hospital for like four days and I haven't shared that on socials just yet because, and I will, and I, I'm a big believer of sharing from, you know, the scar, not the wound, but I think I'm like, oh my God, like so-and-so is going to find out that I was in hospital. And then like people are going to start ringing each other and messaging each other and call. And then my mum's going to ring me and be like, oh my God, your auntie said that you, she knows that you were in hospital. They saw it on Facebook. And it's like, okay, like that's like then me censoring. Exactly. And do I really want to deal with that? But I think that's something that I'm working through. And I think a lot of my clients do work through as well and I think it will become easier I love this because I think that we all experience this and what I really hear is you saying that there's a lot of the work that you do to help people dissolve the mask and actually I'm curious to know if there are any specific tools or actions you help people with in terms of finding their own unique essence but what I hear is a lot of it is about dissolving the masks And yet we still have the side of ourselves that we show our family members, even after we've done all of this work to find out what our true essence is. And so it's ongoing. And and the other thing that I would say is, is that every time we reach a new level of success, there is an invitation for us to step up again. So everything that we thought that we were has to be up-leveled and upgraded if we're going to go to that next level. So again, the work is ongoing. And so the person that our auntie or our brother-in-law or our partner thought that they were getting their heads around as you're like, okay, this is the version of me now. This is what we're doing here. And then you hit this level. It's like, okay, next level. And they're like, hang on a minute. They're always having to catch up with this ever evolving version of you. And I think that that's, it's something that we, we're having to work out, but it's also something that they're having to work out. I, I, I'm curious to know how you feel about that. Oh my God, yeah, there's so much to unpack in that. Like, I also think because we are into self-development and growth, like our mindset is on another level. Like people don't understand this kind of stuff. Like, I can't remember going around and Devinda, my uh, husband's cousin's house like a few months back. And I was like, oh, so do you have any goals for this year? Like any desires? And they were like, no, like, what are you talking about? Goals and desires. And I think, I think it's really difficult because I think, I think sometimes you do really outgrow people as well that aren't on that journey and don't have that expansive mindset. So I, I I think honestly, it's very complicated to navigate, especially the up levels And then when people see you doing all these things, I think, like at my event a few weeks ago, we had like Bangra music and we're all like dancing and like going crazy, which would be completely unimaginable like 40 years ago. Like someone would have probably like come along and like sabotaged that event or, you know, maybe not 40, but like 50 to 60 years ago. That that wouldn't have happened. Asian women wouldn't have traveled to London to be at an Asian woman event, like probably without their husbands and like coming together in that sort of way. But I think what I do teach my clients actually when trying to find like their true essence is I think getting a lot of quiet time and connecting with their intuition because I think now we are so influenced consistently with the information that's coming at us, whether it's TV, Instagram, Facebook. And I think sometimes like people look at other people and think, okay, like they're successful. Maybe I should be doing it that way because that's working for them. But actually what I have found is you have to tap into your own core voice and your own essence. And I think one of the most powerful ways to do that is literally stop looking at what everyone else is doing and what their version of success is and look at what your version of success is 
and then getting that quiet time and that downtime and being very, very mindful with what you're consuming. So like muting accounts, hiding accounts, doing what you need to do because otherwise you just get lost in it all, I think. And then you lose who you are as well because you think you should be doing things a certain way because you feel like that might be working for those certain people. Yeah. I I literally left a voice note about this in my members club earlier on. And I was saying, I think that it's part of the ultimate disruptors formula, like leaning into that infinite pillar of greatness is you being the most full version of yourself you can become. And it's in the fullness of yourself that you become the most different and the most unique person on the planet. And frequently, especially in business, it's normal to look at the person who is the most successful, you know, in your community, it's normal for people to look at you and be like, oh, Sean wears a fluffy hat. Oh, I'm going to add fluffy hat to my marketing strategy because it's working for her. People look at what's going on on the surface level and think that if I emulate that or what's my version of that, I'm going to be successful. And some people are quite good at that. And you will get to a certain level of outward success. But that sense of peace, that sense of joy, that sense of certainty that you have in yourself, you can't get that whilst wearing the fluffy hat because it's not really you. And if Sean stops wearing the fluffy hat and then puts on a flat cap, it's like, oh shit, now it's flat caps. Again, it's not you. A hundred percent. Like I so agree with that. And I think that it's so important as well to define like what success looks like for you. Like success for me last year was like, I had to take time out. I just needed it. And I, I honestly wasn't last year. I just wasn't bothered about like numbers and revenue and followers and impact obviously like I had amazing clients and we still did incredibly incredibly well but like I needed that in that season and I think defining what success looks like for you is so important because I remember like you know Susie when I had my wedding planning business I thought success was running around doing destination weddings being away from home going to like venue visits dealing with these like crazy clients doing high profile weddings high stress weddings but then I actually sat down and yeah. I was like I think I'm just doing this because I think I that's what I think I should be doing and because that's what I'm good at whereas actually I thought that was going to be success for me same when I was at uni I used to watch the apprentice and be like oh my god like can't wait till I get a job when I'm like hooked on my Blackberry, working on my laptop, working really hard and going to all these meetings. And then when I got it, I was like, this was going to look fast. Like, I feel like this. So you've got to really work out what feels good, you know? You were like, I do not like this Blackberry. <laughs> no, it's <laughs> not happening. I'm showing my age. <laughs> yeah, you just aged yourself. I really want to talk about your relationship because I feel that your husband is a very special guy. In order for him to deal with you, he has got to be cut from a different kind of cloth. I don't think that I ever remember you ever saying that you ever had any challenges with him. And I think that that is quite remarkable because even in the time that we worked together, you were in the process of letting go of the wedding business. You were stepping into who you were as a mentor. So again, lots of change. And I think that it's really normal for most people in relationships when they're going through change for their partner to be a bit like, hey, hang on a minute, what's happening? I don't actually remember you ever communicating that to me. That doesn't mean that it wasn't there, but I'm just, I'm curious about his personality and how that has really supported you over the years. Yeah, that's like so interesting. So my husband, he's obviously Asian. Not obvious to everybody who doesn't know you (laughs) and your marriage. No, I think I had a perception of Asian men before I married him. So like the Asian men in my life, 
or whether it's been my cousins who have had like, so I'm the only girl actually on my dad's side of the family, which has, you know, made things really complicated as well, because that's why everyone was really strict on me when I was growing up because I was the only girl. And my cousins, I get on really, really well with like all of them. They're amazing. And we've always had these strong male characters, I think, on my side of the family. But they've always been really masculine men, like typical masculine Asian men, like loud and proud, you know, that kind of thing. I think definitely there's been this sense of like, I think it's been quite fair. Like, I don't think they're like sexist or anything. But I do think the men probably dominate a little bit more, I th- I would say, in just the family dynamic. But I think with Dav, he is so different to what I've ever known. When I got married to him, I think my confidence came so much from him giving me confidence because I thought like, obviously, like, I would never have married him if I thought he was going to be like that. But I used to think a long time before I'd met him, like Asian men are like this or my Asian men are like that. But he's actually always just been so supportive in what I do. He's always said like he's never had an issue with what I do. And he actually came to the event. He's never been to any of my events, but he came a, a few weeks ago and he wasn't going to come to the event. He was just staying because he was meeting friends in, in Canary Wharf as well. And he literally like, I remember like he caught a glimpse of, of the end of a, like, a panel and like he was just like so supportive. He like WhatsApp me going, oh my God, these events are amazing. How can we scale these up? I'm like, hello. He was like, you're so good. And he's always been really supportive. And I think that I'm really lucky to have someone like him. Like, you know, like when I've had to travel with work, I I remember like a few years ago, I think we were coaching them when I went to the Brendan and Prashad event in how was it? It was in America somewhere. I can't remember. San Diego. Yeah, like he's always been very, very relaxed, chilled out. And I think because he's really ambitious and he is definitely a high achiever, we've just got this like, we just want a better life for ourselves. Like we just want to make sure like we make our ancestors proud. We make our future lineage really proud. He's a change maker in his family. I'm a change maker in my family. So I think because we have those like shared values and we're on the same trajectory, we've got this very similar goals together. We know we were, what kind of wealth we want to build, what kind of lifestyle we want to have. I think if he wasn't like that, then I think it becomes very different. And he's also recently become very spiritually inclined. Like he's very into angel numbers and conversations with God and reading the alchemist. So I think I think it just makes it easier when we're just the same, you know. So what about all of the people in your audience who are married to more traditional Asian men? How do you support them in their journeys? I'll be really honest. So many of my clients have like split up, got a divorce. Like, I know that's probably not what everyone wants to hear, but I think, honestly, like, I think there's a difference between traditional men and toxic men. And I I definitely see this with my clients. So obviously, if someone's very, very toxic and you don't align, then, you know, those conversations need to be had. But I think if you are with someone who's quite traditional, then I think it's just about open communication, and communicating your own needs and your own boundaries. And I think that if the person on the other side like wants what's best for you and is not, you know, thinking about themselves constantly and their ego, like they'll hopefully be on board with your vision. Um, I think it becomes problematic when, especially that with Asian men, like they want to dominate, they want to be in control. And, you know, these kind of like old roles are expected of Asian women like I definitely had that when I first got married like I've got quite traditional in-laws so I I still can't cook Indian food (laughs) so I think there was an expectation that I would be able to like cook Indian food I have a cleaner for example and that is like so frowned upon (laughs) because obviously traditionally like Asian women would do all the housework and like cook and clean but I think we are living in a new era. I think that Asian women are becoming more empowered and we are really challenging these cultural norms that we've been brought up with. So 
I think we need to communicate our needs. We need to communicate our boundaries in a kind and compassionate way and come, I think, especially with husbands, relationships, marriages, like come to some sort of post like solution that works. It's totally possible, I think. Sean, when you think about where you would love to see your network in 10 years time, what's the vision that you have yeah, I've been thinking about this recently, actually. And I, th- I find it really difficult to be like, having like 10 year visions. And I just find it really difficult to like future cast like that. But I think for me, it's really having global impact. And we're already doing that because I've got international clients, which is amazing. But it's really, you know, globally impacting people through events, through retreats through my coaching and mentoring and reaching as many Asian women as possible and showing them a different different way. I love this so much. For any person within the Asian community, I mean, this is really anybody who's listening to the podcast, but anybody that particularly resonates with your message, who is thinking about taking the first step, but a little bit unsure because it does feel new. They know that it's going to be an an up level. They know that this is the start of their transformation. What one or two things do you want to share with them to support them in making that move? As in like starting their business and just transforming, right? There's just so much, so much that I could go into. But I think, I think the first step is getting around like-minded people, especially in our culture. I think if you're not around like-minded women or peers, I think that's really important. So finding, even if it's like a really small community of people that can really lift you up and cheer you on. And I think that you've just got to start. I think so many people wait to figure out the complete path, figure out the complete journey, but you never know what that's going to be until you get on the path. And so many people are scared of getting on the path. And I think that like, you've just got to start. And I think that things don't need to be perfect. Things don't need to be polished. I'm a real big believer as like refining as you go along. So I think if you want to start your business, it's literally just starting. I know that sounds so simple, but so many people, especially I know Asian women, like put so many blocks and barriers. And I think rather than thinking like, oh my God, it has to be perfect when I launch it. I just think having like that experimental mindset, I think in entrepreneurship in general serves you really well. Because I think if you keep thinking like, oh my God, like this is it. And this is how it's got to be. And you don't, if you just switch your mindset to be like, it's just an experiment. We're just testing this, mm-hmm. seeing how it works. I think that is just such a a better mindset shift rather than just being like, oh my God, it has to be perfect. Oh my God, it didn't work. And just constantly worrying. Okay. I love this. Sean, I could speak to you for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours, but I am conscious we don't have that. But what, how I love to finish all of my interviews is with six quick fire questions inspired by wow. the pillars of infinite receiving. So my first question for you is when I say the words infinite receiving, what does infinite receiving mean to you? Allowing yourself to be fully supported. Yes. How good are you at that? I think I could definitely get better in getting support for sure. But I think allowing in support and feeling worthy of support is so important to infinite receiving. Yeah, a thousand percent. So where or who in your life right now could you allow yourself to be loved just a little bit more? As in who by? Yeah, who, by, or where specifically in your life could you allow a little bit more love in? I think definitely from my friends, for sure. It's recently it's been very busy, so I could definitely allow more of that in. Okay, great. I'm hoping that you're making mental notes in alignment with these answers. What is your greatest attribute? I would say my greatest attribute is that... I am very good at listening. Okay, really good. 
What is one thing that you are consciously manifesting right now? Moving to the Middle East. Ooh. Are you going to Dubai? Yeah, we were actually meant to be last year until we kind of pulled the plug last minute. But it's definitely on the cards. Maybe not Dubai, but definitely the Middle East somewhere over the next next few years. As long as the situation right now, obviously in the Middle East, it's a bit unstable. Yeah. As long as things stabilize, then definitely I would say in the next three years, two to three years. You are such a UAE person. You know, like, I'm there. We're there. We're going shopping. It's Sean's treat. (laughs) Final question. Where or who specifically, which relates to actually your answer about love, maybe, can you allow to support you just a little bit more? So where could you allow some more support in? Where or who? I think my team. I know that sounds really annoying, but I think... Earlier, I was doing this admin task, and you know this from me, so he's like, like, why am I doing this? Like, why? My team could just do this, but I just like to control, and I like to know what's going on, so I find it really difficult, so definitely allowing more support in from my team. Yeah. I mean, I, I love all of these answers. Can you please tell my audience where they can find more of your magic? Yeah, so I'm mostly hanging out on Instagram and my Instagram handle is Asian underscore female underscore entrepreneur. Thank you so much, Sean. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I'm so glad that we've reconnected after a little break and I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much for having me, Susie. And just, it's been so amazing. And just obviously witnessing your journey as well and the the different rebirths and reiterations. It's just been incredible to watch. Thank Thank you. Thank you so much. If you have enjoyed listening to this episode as much as I have enjoyed taking part in it, then please do me a favor, tag us on Instagram and share this episode with at least one friend that you know will benefit from all of Sean's golden nuggets. And in the meantime, please remember that faith plus action equals miracles. Thank you for listening to Infinite Receiving with me, Susie Ashworth. I'd love to share with you my Infinite Receiving activation audio. Go to susieashworth.com forward slash activate infinite receiving.